wanted to just take some time to discuss any new developments in terms of shifts that you have noticed in mass consciousness narratives or worldviews. And we surely have had an expansion of worldview since the June 25th uh, assessment from the US Office on National Intelligence on unexplained aerial phenomenon. So um, we'll have the opportunity today to exchange thoughts on how we can broaden the scope of consciousness and evolve our collective awareness to integrate the expansion that is taking place right now. And then we'll also hear from Alan um, about his Luis uh, Alessandro interview. He's the former head of the Pentagon's uh, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, which they call ATIP. And Luis, I think many of you probably know, he led the Pentagon's efforts to investigate UFOs until October 2017. And he was, he actually resigned in protest um, because he felt that there was a excessive secrecy um, happening um, and he wanted to just be more free. And then also Alan, and I listened to this the other day, had a fascinating interview with counter intel, intel uh, agent Richard Dotty. is that his name? Dodi, Dodi. Dodi, okay. And then we also, and hopefully uh, when JJ, if he comes on, um, we wanted to talk a little bit more about our thoughts on this extraterrestrial space travel ventures of different billionaires like Richard Branson, his crew of Virgin Galactic, as we know, they went um, up into space. And then also Jeff Bezos, who's the founder of Amazon and his team took the Blue Origin rocket up. And then Elon Musk of uh, SpaceX is creating a spaceship that will take humans to the moon and Mars. Um, so we just wanted to share a little bit about our thoughts and perspectives on this. Um, and then on our last call, many of the members felt that doing regular practices together um, and strengthening our inherent human capacities, I know Jean and John mentioned that and some others, um, James sent a, a visualization, and that this would support our collective mission. Um, so we'll try to integrate that um, suggestion into our calls. And Oscar also sent something beautiful, and he'll be closing our program today. And um, yeah, so James suggested this audio library um, so we can also get these practices out to the general public. Like I know, Alan, you were saying earlier, how do we get more of our mission out to the public? So if anyone would like to offer anything that we can put in our video library, just let me know and we'll just add it to the collection. Um, the video library is what, Diane? We're gonna the start video? saving um, videos and audios. Oh. Like James sent that amazing um, oh. video, audio visualization and Oscar sent something that I included in the last reminder of the call. Um, so we'll just start collecting these and then have a library for others. Um, we'll have to think about how to share them um, more publicly. But yes, so if you have anything to add to the collection, um, we're just starting to, to collect those right now. And then uh, Oscar's going to end um, with um, a practice for us and we'll close the call. So shall we just start with any updates that people have or Alan, maybe you want to share a little bit about the interviews? I can just say Alessandro is appearing more and more. And uh, do, does everyone know Alessandro? Like Diane said, he started the, he, he was the original, I guess, um, person, main person in the ATIP program, which was um, created by Harry Reid, Senator Harry Reid in 2007 to investigate UAPs. And Harry Reid got a tip from John Glenn, the former astronaut and then Senator saying, you know, maybe you should look into these. And um, Harry Reid was also associated with, um, uh, who's the guy in Las Vegas, uh, Susan, the um, Bigelow, Bob Bigelow, right? Right, Bob Bigelow, who was also very interested in UFOs. So Harry Reid got this money that he didn't tell the rest of the Congress about to start this ATIP program, which was headed by Elizondo. Elizondo, from what I've known, and I actually want to talk to him about this, a, a about his personal idea, he was a regular 
intelligence officer looking into, you know, Russian and Chinese stuff. And he was given this assignment and he comes across these documents about these flying craft. And he sort of says, oh, my God, what's going on here? How come we don't know about this? He talks to the higher ups and generals and says, aren't you worried about this? And he and um, because the program was called the Advanced Aerial Threat Identification Program, and they needed that word threat in there in order to get money supposedly to fund the program because it's Pentagon related and they always wanna have a threat just to, 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 to you know, ensure that there's money. So anyway, Alessandro's talking to these IR ups and these generals say, aren't you worried about this? And the generals don't seem to be really worried about this because they are in our airspace, but they do not seem from what it appears to have really interfered with any commercial or military aircraft. So are they a threat? Well, one of the reasons they might be considered a threat is that they also appeared over nuclear missile silos in Russia and the US and have turned off and on the nuclear codes and maybe we're the threat and they're just protecting us from ourselves. That's what I think. And um, so Alessandro kind of says, why don't we know this? How come this is a secret? And everyone just sort of doesn't seem to want to bring this out into the public. So yes, he quit in protest and uh, I guess it was 2017. And he formed a private organization with Tom DeLong and Chris Mellon. And they've been slowly at the edge of this disclosure movement. I mean, they've been coming out and Alessandro, did everyone see the 60 Minutes program? I could show, uh, should I just show that quickly, a little clip of the 60 Minutes? I could show my interview, but in my interview, I say, well, are these aliens? He goes, well, we really can't say they're aliens. They are from somewhere. They may be interdimensional beings. They may be us, they may be parallel dimensions. So he kind of avoids the A word there, as I, I call it. But um, on, on um, just to make a little quick review here, um, on 60 Minutes, um, Bill Whitaker says, and I'll just play this briefly. Can I just share my screen just to catch everyone up to date? Oh, and he's actually, I'll just say it. Bill Whitaker asks Elizondo, so are these things real? Elizondo looks exasperated and says, come on, Bill, we're already past that point now. The government, the Navy has admitted these things are real. And that's sort of where we're at. There's a lot of new footage that Elizondo has been talking about, a 23 minute tape that hasn't been released yet where a vehicle high definition is morphing from one shape into another. And no one can explain that physics. So the government's at a loss. We need to keep talking about it being more public. I, I mean, I know Susan has been for a long time and uh, me and lots of people saying this is a reality and everyone needs to know that basically we're not alone in the universe. That's why I wrote this book. That's JJ's work going back to 1978. JJ, you want to say something about the initial work that you've been doing? Actually, it goes far back uh, into the early 70s and the 60s. Uh, some of you know I have worked behind the scenes uh, with the astronauts and people having top secret clearance. So there's uh, popular information that's not coming out, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, uh, the, uh, the real story is rather uh, overwhelming and brings into discussion uh, the background of Western and Eastern philosophy, theosophy, and mystical traditions, and particularly the indigenous that are, frank, frankly, the most honest, in my opinion, a face-to-face relationships and trade-offs with the extraterrestrial civilizations have been going on for centuries. But <clears throat> I do have in my library uh, some small books I wrote. One is called Beyond Darwinism. It's looking, uh, I guess, my... It's okay. Appropriate, but uh, this book, Beyond Darwinism, goes back to the, the Near Eastern uh, myth, myths and legends. It's a good primer showing how the people in Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, 
uh, often worship what they considered fish beans, beans that had vehicles that went into the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea and came out in human form and then went back into the sea. This would probably tie into what our US Navy has been working with in terms of underwater subcraft. Top secret programs going on for many years. I also have another book called Extraterrestrial Retrievals, which has been reviewed by military intelligence that deals with 10 extraordinary cases of actual specimens that have been recovered. This would be somewhat in line with the recent work of Paula Harris and Jacques Vallée entitled uh, Trinity. And your book, Alan. So uh, there's a plethora of information. The problem is there's so much information on so many levels, the, uh, the government doesn't really what to know what to do in terms of coming up with the basic blueprint, but that will be our quest in terms of a public approach. Right. With issues uh, of sociology, culture, history, psychology, and cosmology. So it's a multi-level blueprint that we need. Well, I think that's why we're all here. We're, we're a lot of people are talking about a people's movement. And Susan, do you want to just talk about your involvement and your a little bit of your history because you've been at this for a long, long time? I mean, so do you want to just talk about where where you're coming from? Sure. Um, <laughs> I didn't think I was going to talk today, so uh, oh. I, I thought I could just like be in the background a bit. Um, I, I, no, that's OK. It's OK. I, I also want to thank um, Jean and John um, Pearson um, that Jean and John had invited me into um, this call today and they'd been speaking about this group for a while. So I just want to acknowledge and because I'm on my little phone, I can't see everybody all at once. I wish I could, uh, but I can't. I can see you, Ellen, but I can't, I can't see anybody else right now. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I, I try not to be too, too public. I, I come out when I need to and have something hopefully relevant to say that's going to make a difference. Um, lifetime contactee um, did contribute to the free research um, with Ray Hernandez, uh, wrote a chapter with Dr. John Klimo on that. Um, I was involved in Dr. Mack's group uh, when I was in my early early 20s uh, in, in Boston. Um, and let's see what else, um, work in the free energy arena, uh, run new energy movement, uh, and wrote a book with um, Gene Manning called Hidden Energy. And so that's basically about um, these inventors that are inspired to create these different types of technologies primarily for um, this planetary shift, this planetary transition. So that's a, a little bit about the work. Um, is there anything else in particular you want me to say, Alan? I'm happy. Oh, to no, no, I think I just want people to know your work and who you are and, you know, your contributions to yeah. this movement. Um, because I think it is a movement. And I think this group is about how do we bring this? I mean, this is my idea. I know there's a mission statement, but Diane, and everyone, how do we bring this forward? How do we bring these ideas out to the world as evolutionary leaders and whatever else we are to, to make it more an acceptable conversation and to look at new ways that we can understand the phenomena? That's another idea. So everyone understands it differently and relates to it differently, but something's happening on planet Earth. It is an awakening and... And I think this organization, Source of Synergy, can be a leader in that field. I mean, I think that's why we're here. So that's sort of a base. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, JJ. So uh, I, I, I'm op I think we're all open to what other people want to bring into this conversation, how we can move forward as an organization, as a, as a, a synergy circle. I mean, what ideas do you have, Diane, to move this conversation forward? Well, I'd just be interested in hearing from people in terms of if they have experienced any shifts of worldview, even, you know, personally, because I just feel like since this report on June uh, 26, that there's been so much more of an openness everywhere in terms of these topics. So, you know, what yeah. can we, like you're saying, what can we practically do to reach the general public more? With this well, has everyone have everyone seen the report? I mean, has have people? We've all looked at the because I just want to think. Say, there's one really key line. I think it's on page. It's on page four, 
where it says there's been socio-cultural stigmas mm -hmm. remaining as obstacles to, uh, in collecting data on UAPs. Now, those socio-cultural stigmas were instituted by the government, the Pentagon, the Air Force in particular, going back to the 50s, where they would ridicule people coming forward saying they had a sighting. So they're talking about undoing that, but they created it in the first place, which is so frustrating. So um, yeah, a really important comment I want to make is from an interview I heard from Michio Kaku, who, of course, is the physicist at City University of New York, who was so well known and so well informed. And he said two things that are very, very important. First, he said, you know, he said, I'm talking now to all the mainstream scientists and physicists, and the conversation has completely changed since the Navy and the Pentagon validated uh, these uh, videos, and particularly the fact that they are uh, Raytheon displays from these jets. And if people don't know when you watch that, when the pilot yells, got it, what that means is that he's got a lock on that vehicle and his Raytheon uh, equipment can read all of its data. So they have all of these data readouts on all of the technical capacities of these craft once they're able to get a lock on it. So that was a big part of that video when that pilot says, got it. And anyway, so then the other part Kaku says is that before those mainstream releases and verifications, the burden of proof was on the public and the vast array of experiences in the public to prove that something here was real. He said, now, since those mainstream verifications and disclosures, the burden of proof, and he said in the scientific community discussion, the burden of proof, I'm gonna quote him now, is on the government to prove that these are not from somewhere else. So he said, it's a complete shift relative to the discussion of data as real data. And I thought that was uh, important and it reflected Senator Reed's comment that I actually quoted in my endorsement of Alan's uh, book. And that was that this is no longer in the world of speculation that's in the world of science. Right. Uh, where was that Misho Kaku interview? Uh, it was only for... about three days ago on CNN. I'll have to okay. see if I can find it. Okay. Also to support those that are actually having the courage to speak out, like your interview with Richard, I was so impressed that he was able to share about his experience actually seeing an alien, a tall gray alien, being interviewed telepathically. Right. Yeah. I don't know who was interviewing him, maybe another officer. But like when people speak out and there's not the stigma, then they're more likely to speak out even more. So if we could spread the word um, in this way, like you've been doing with new realities, I think that's really key. Well, that's one aspect of speaking out. The other aspect of speaking out are the contactees, the people actually having these interdimensional consciousness experience. So uh, that's both sides of it. You know, there's really three aspects to the whole thing. There's the contactees, there's the government, and there's the intelligence itself, whatever that is. So all those things are converging in a sense. I mean, Alan, I think there's another one that came out in the interview that you had with Lou, uh, uh, S. Moda, which was, it shocked me actually, but you were talking about the report that came out and what was between the lines was saying yeah. more than what was actually written. And he also said something that he said that one of the sort of the challenges within the folks who are writing the report and those around them was as a very strong evangelical Christian antipathy wow. to bringing this out because from an evangelical Christian perspective, these are demons. Right, right. So I, I don't think we can avoid seeing how that plays out because there's a lot of evangelism within the military and within the government. So I just would like to sort of presence that because I think that's a good challenge. That, that is so important because that's been a huge roadblock to disclosure and some people feel that's been one of the biggest. You take that with the corporate interests that obviously don't want this, what these, these vehicles are not filling up their gas tank to get here. So they, um, 
that's the other, these are in the way, it's not so much aliens or whatever they are, it's these forces that are very attached to an old paradigm or really old paradigm. So yeah, that's a really great point. So I think it's great to name some of this and also the forces that are proposing to move forward. I was just talking to a guy named Mark Sims who's working with Danny Sheehan, who is Luis Alessandro's lawyer. And, and he's starting a people's movement. And JJ is very close with Mark. And we, this is just in the works and we don't know if it'll happen, but we're talking about having a rally in Washington in front of the Lincoln Memorial where speakers can come up and talk about why this is so important, get government, get these former government officials. This is like the possibility. I don't know if it'll come off. Movie stars, rock bands. I mean, this is, but to show that it's like how we stopped the Vietnam War and how all these great social causes have um, been brought to a larger public. This is just something in the works. We'll see if it, if it comes off a projected date to do that would be around July 8th, which of 2022, which would be the 75th anniversary of the Roswell crash, or who knows when that crashed, but somewhere in that beginning part of July. So that's just possibility. Keep it to yourselves because it's still in development. But um, I think that would be really an amazing thing to have happen. Yes. Anyway, that's one other avenue there. And one other thing, there's been increased sightings around the world. I mean, this has come out in Cheryl Costa's desk reference that, uh, of UFO sightings. There's been over 100,000 sightings that have been reported um, around the country in the last 10 years. And I think, I think well, we reported a sighting, me and Kurt and Emily, that um, wasn't actually a sighting. But for all those sightings that are reported, I would say there's probably 50 or 100 or more that go unreported. So it does seem like there's been a huge influx of this activity. And I don't know why SETI, the Search for Intelligent Life out there, can't, can't find that on their telescope. It's just... It's like they're, you know, it's it's so strange. They're looking for something out there and it's right here. It's right. Anyway, that's sort of another little factor. So yeah, actually the, the chair of SETI just recently switched sides on that. You know, mm -hmm. for a long time he said that there was that it's all about looking out there and not about looking here. Now he's saying the opposite. He says now there's a consistency. It's about a week ago I saw this interview. Uh, he said, now there's a, consist a consistency between all the money that we've spent looking out there and now realizing from the, again, the verified disclosures from the mainstream that we also need uh, to look here and that that makes the reality consistent. You know, it's also what JJ talks about a lot in, and especially in the chapter they wrote in, in my book, Making Contact, is that it's a vibrational aspect of these beings. Yeah, there are hardware that may be 3D, but there's other levels that as a kind of spiritual group from in, you know, circle, we have to also kind of just not have to, but it's part of the discussion. Well, a, I knew, uh, if I can just jump in here, I knew John yeah. Lowe and Joe Tarter, who were really the main forces behind SETI at NASA Ames, Northern California back in the 80s. And they told me privately that you know, this was the generation of having to get actual physical metallurgical specimens. The nuts and bolts mindset really ruled the SETI program at that time. And that's why I think other than uh, contributors like Paul Horowitz and others who gave large sums to SETI, most people were discouraged by the mid nineties and nothing of any importance had turned up. But getting back to what you said, Alan, uh, there has to be a united front here there's too much information that's being put on the table from uh, the shamans, uh, sociologists, uh, people of culture, history who have been able to open up their, the, the uh, archives of information showing a long history of information suggesting we're not alone in the universe. <clears throat> the statements by astronauts and people in the space program, it's now it's time to move on with a whole new approach. And then also, the situation that Jude had referred to, the evangelical aside, 
that's been helped uh, by some uh, of the greater minds in the world of science who feel that uh, extraterrestrials do represent a threat using the Spanish Portuguese model <clears throat> of colonialism as a model. So, I mean, their arguments are solid and there are uh, areas of information that we will not get into this discussion because it's rather alarming that there have been abductions and uh, humans uh, that have been subjected to mutilation. So that's a story that people don't want to put center. It's, it's there in the background and would suggest by all great uh, civilizations and religious theologies do have this dialectic between positive and negative forces in the cosmos. That's a reality. We can't just all be Sunday school children and think everything is good or be a fundamentalist and think everything is bad. No, we're, everything that's here on the mother earth is also in the sky. Good and bad amongst all of us. But JJ, the, the importance I think of your presence is that you've actually met interdimensional beings and um, had an incredible upliftment. And I think this is the shift we're really in. Yeah, there's hardware, but there's also a shift of consciousness where we will meet the others on a new playing field. Can you comment on that? Absolutely. And again, I want to say that the, the negatives by far are in the minority. The vast uh, levels of cosmic intelligence are very, very positive. And to that end, we really need to move quickly for a what I would call global educational program to bootstrap in every area of public information and science. Uh, to that end, I've just come out with a new book with a uh, space law scientist called Galactic Law, which will be able to lay down the ground rules for negotiating with those cosmic civilizations that put science uh, for all humanity first and foremost. I also have done several films in the past uh, with leading uh, scholars and academics that I will bring out of my archive and make available to those of you in this uh, conversation who are interested in looking at the spiritual perspectives. But uh, clearly, the game is not extraterrestrial, it is ultra terrestrial, the game behind the game. So the extraterrestrials that have been in charge with some of these experiments are going to have to give accountability for the mismanagement of information given to various governments over the centuries through the government scientists or psychics or astrologers who've been basically the intermediaries for some of this information that until recently has been considered science fiction or uh, religious fantasy. We have to find a, a middle ground where we can really interpret through an independent group of citizens, uh, Ellen, that you speak about, who have uh, academic uh, uh, credentials who are solid in looking at the norms of civilization and right. look to the frontiers of being a cosmic humanity moving forward to know the, the ground rules that we must take with us into space. Right. I think what John and Jean, I think I can um, just bring them in, is that what they also, um, I think from what you said is that these interfacing with these other beings as we prepare ourselves to shift consciousness in order to meet the other is a, a, a bigger a, a big part of what we want to also create here. How do we interface? What is the level of consciousness we need to go to? Also with Oscar's work and uh, how do we shift conscious to meet the other to to meet these beings on an even playing field and, um, and, and bring in this greater human awareness that has just been dormant in us, but has always been available to some shamans and teachers who have activated that knowingness. So yeah, this John, is really yeah. just quickly, I wanted to say this is really an energetic opening right now because there's such a release of control over what has been a secret for so long. And we're seeing real humility, like even President Obama saying, you know, they're out there, we just don't know what it is. And when I was listening to your interview with Richard Doty, I was having a lot of compassion, even for the government, because he said something like, how can they admit that they can't protect a five-year-old girl from being wow. abducted and what happens to her, right? And so it was wow. like a parent saying, I can't protect my child. So I think just looking at this whole situation from a different perspective um, and then taking it from there, like, okay, we can celebrate. There's like an opening. People are finally sharing what they felt like they couldn't share before. And we can have real compassion for even the government for having their rationale for sharing. 
Yeah, and this opening, which also Kurt talks about, is that we are not who we've been conditioned to think we are. We are of the cosmos. We are of a greater mind. Life is not an accident of creation, but an emergent property of existence. So this is the big shift. This is what wakes us up to the big reality. And, and Kurt's always talking about how, you know, people get stuck. Scientists get stuck in this way and they like Neil deGrasse Tyson, a kind of intelligent guy, I think. But he, my, my favorite quote from him is like, some people know a little bit about something to think they're right, but not enough about something to know that they're wrong. That's a quote from him. And that's exactly what I would say to him if I could talk to him. So this is the, this is the moment of choice we're in. Do we move forward and say, yeah, there's more to reality, obviously, or do we stay stuck in the old, trying to defend an old paradigm? And yeah, so and if, that, that was reflected recently, and I think it does explain Neil deGrasse Tyson, a, a survey that was done that something like 99% of all new PhDs in cosmology, astrophysics, go through the whole list, all start with the premise that we are not alone and that life is ubiquitously a part of the emergent, just the way things work in the universe. Life you know, happens automatically everywhere. And they start now with that assumption, which is completely a different assumption than came from that, that, former, um, you know, that former older group. So it's a big sea change. Thank you. So is there right. any more so sharing? There was, the there was an interview with Eric Von Deineken about that, which was very interesting because what he said was, uh, I turned out to be right, sometimes for the right reasons and sometimes for the wrong reasons, but that there were people that drew these conclusions early on just from intuition or just generality before the data was there. But now the data is there and people are starting uh, with the assumptions that Dinah can put on the table. Right. I actually just want to show a recent survey, Diane, which Okay, a minute if anybody uh, else wants to share before Jean and John, um, they're going to do an experiential yeah. sound. Okay. Experience. Now, just, this is a recent uh, poll by Pew, P-E-W. But the interesting factor is that uh, best guess intelligent life exists on other planets. The 18 to 29-year-olds, 76%, that is the largest group in there, that believe there is intelligent life out there. So it is with these people who are open, younger, open-minded. And um, I just thought that was really curious that that was by far the largest group that believed that there was life out there. There's another survey that says 65% of the American people have seen or know someone who's seen a UFO. So. These are just statistics, but this is a siege and we are at the threshold of a new time, a new moment. And we in this group, Source of Synergy, I think could be foundational in sort of formatting an approach to this new reality. And I think these discussions, these initial discussions can start to uh, gear us in a way to how to present something in a larger format. That's that's my under. That's my Thank idea. You, Alan. I hope. So before we move on to the experiential practice with Jean and John and then Oscar at the end, does anybody else want to add anything to this conversation? I, I know Jeff, maybe you might have something because we were talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to hear what Jeff today. has to say. <laughs> I don't think I can be brief. Well, I know you had I some interesting on... thoughts on this. So <laughs> let's yeah. let that um, incubate a bit longer because I'm about to go into a retreat and I think I'll have a better formulation. Okay, so maybe on our next call, you can you can share. Anybody else would like to share before we? Nina and um, JJ. Okay, so Nina, go ahead. And then JJ. I'm muting and without sounding uneducated and unknowledgeable, un uh, where do the pictures of masters, teachers and guides fit into this concept? uh because JJ. there's a lot of proof around that you know yeah well jj has been involved with that directly so what do you think jj the uh, i think we're at a time of a cosmic jackpot uh i'm so happy that we're having this conversation the experiences i have had uh and desiree was not here this 
with me would agree I've been overwhelmingly very positive. Uh, the cosmic others do include the higher categories of those who have graduated beyond evolution and are in an energized form or what I would call a superluminal form. And that uh, is another category that requires a more embrace of psychology. Uh, I think we're really fortunate to see so many sides of human society come to the front with some excitement and intuition that uh, we have much to gain, very little to lose by being too overcritical. I know we have Stephen Hawking, who I respect, he's a great mind, but before he died, he went over to the negative side saying that uh, this will set back civilization. I disagree. Uh, I've known some of the top scientists behind the scenes at the top of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I personally talked to presidents in other countries who have had personal experiences. I will not go into that right now, but uh, they would agree with Nina. These were spiritual beings that appeared to them, what I call spiritual non-physical manifestations of a face or energy geometry that yeah. telepathically downloaded or gave information that there was a higher reason for life, that we had to overcome our isms, our nationalisms, our militarisms, the extremisms, if we were gonna go forward. And that's not being done in the playing field. And we have a lot of work ahead for us, but it really requires us to enter into the realm of prayer and meditation and higher understanding, which my late sister Barbara Mark Hubbard was what? a good spokesman uh, person for. We, we have to understand it's the spiritual dynamic that behind all of this consciousness out of which mind and material reality proceeds. That's the hidden trigger. And if we can place our mindset every day to think positive in prayer for human unity, we're taking that first step, that, that incredible step that allows us to go into inner contact before we go into outer contact. Right. I'm also, thank you, JJ. I'm also curious in what Oscar or Cindy might have to say from an indigenous perspective, because as, as people know, John Mack's last book was Passport to the Cosmos, where he sort of integrated that spiritual perspective into the contact experience. So any Oscar, Cindy, any Oscar? Looks like you're fish. Yeah. Like Jeff, uh, what I have to say would take um, tomes. At the same time, uh, I will do my best to in a position this uh, dialogue in a manner that, that makes sense both academically and from a point of view of the spiritual implications for this uh, global event that is occurring. So from an academic perspective, I feel we need a methodology that's, that is a phenomenological hermeneutic. We, the problem with the fact that what JJ mentioned in terms of that there are these evil versus these benevolent beings, and that's part of the cosmos, it's part of the universe, because that's the way we understand the, the material universe to evolve and based on oppositional forces that create a third transcendent expression of itself. From a perspective of our human experience, the reason that it's evil, it's because it's associated with a moral uh, dimension and right. or an ethical view. Because in my experience, and I've been around council fires for now 40 years, hearing stories of contact, hearing stories not only of contact, but of befriending at a level of cooperation by the indigenous elders and their communities with our star relatives. And in all of those experiences, I've never heard an abduction story. I have never heard a mutilation story. I have never heard anything like that. Those are relegated to the realm of the imaginal, of the demonic, of the psychic dimension of our human experience and take the form of the pistacos and the other forms of, of little creatures that go ahead and steal children or eat children, but it's more of a folk tradition than an actual experiential event. So therefore, it's these are areas that I feel are very important to plant seeds in, is how we interpret what is real, R-E-A-L as a friendly holographic projection that exists simply because you guys want Oscar to be on screen right now, because that's the bottom line, right? I feel we need to truly be aware of what our own creative power is. 
what our own ability to manifest multidimensional reality in some sort of field of expression that makes evolutionary sense to the collective that is humanity. And that's only going to be possible by going within. Whatever discoveries we experience in the outside world ultimately will lead to an encounter with ourselves, capital S, within. So therefore, the, the approach that I would take would be always one of introspection, of interiorization, of merging with soul, rather than being so keen on finding proof and evidence on a physical level. That's just my two cents in a nutshell. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think it's both inner and outer, but yeah, everyone has their own approach. Um, Cindy, anything you want to share or Janice or Jane? Yeah. Or Olivia? I'd like to take up the sort of inner side that Oscar was talking about, because we focus this evening very much on outer connection, physical viewings or whatever. But what about telepathic contact? This seems to me the way that they're making communication. So I'm wondering yeah. if we could open that area up a bit. Yeah, no, that, that, is a big, that is a big part of contact is telepathy absolutely is the language of consciousness. So yeah, was there a question, Janice, or that was just a statement or that was? That was a statement, but okay. um, just or to say that I, I once had a very fast, unexpected encounter with a group that I knew was the Intergalactic Council. Um, and I, when, I, I, when I came back, I, it was so fast, I was physically shaking for about 20 minutes just from the pure speed of the whole thing. But I found myself facing them and saying to them, we're pleased to deliver you back planet Earth as a sacred planet as part of the whole cosmic system. Mm. Um, and then just now when we had our introductory meditation, I was told my connection is with the Intergalactic Council rather than with any one star system. Uh -huh. There's a lot of channelings coming forward now. There's a group called Aurora, which posts these different people's channeling from some of the main star systems like Andromedans and Pleiadians and Syrians and Lyrans. Um, and you know, I think this whole area is an important part of what we're discussing. Yeah, thank you. That's great. I mean, I'd love to hear more from the Intergalactic Council, but maybe another time. <laughs> <laughs> James yeah, or Olivia. Oh, Jeff just raised his okay. finger for a sec. Oh, no. There's just, there's one point that I can add briefly, and that's every time that I've calibrated where in the field these, these experiences, these encounters are originating, I've gotten um, a level within transpersonal consciousness. So there's, I want to add that in, in addition to exploring the connection with the ascended masters and ultra terrestrials, all these different layers of being. Um, there's the collectivity of our own nature, which is somehow participating and showing up in forms that we can relate to until we've awoken more to our own transpersonal nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that ties in perfectly to the increase in sightings that we see cyclically around the world, because the more destabilized that collective consciousness that Jeff mentions is, uh, you know, gestated through human fear and, and polarization and conflict, uh, that is expressed archetypically in that type of phenomena. Uh, nothing new. I mean, Carl Jung posed this, uh, you know, decades ago in his beautiful little book uh, on flying saucers. And the fact that right now there is such turmoil in the world it, it, to me, it's a very natural externalization of that internal angst, that ontological insecurity we're experiencing as a species, that beings that are beyond our comprehension will start to go ahead and reflect that as an option, as a gateway to something more elevated, more sky world, in, in a sense. So you can find ample historical evidence of those you know, periods of intensification of sightings around the world depicted through art, nothing we don't know about. Telepathically is crucial. My own experience, my association with the Rama mission, hence the photo that I shared with all of you, 
and my follow-up email today that was taken in 1987, way before that I'd had contact telepathically. And then also in what seems to be an external form, the materialization of star beings that is witnessed together with a group that I was involved with when I was very immersed in the Rama work. So I've had both the inner and outer contact and it continues to this day. Mm -hmm. I feel that it's a natural aspect of human uh, evolutionary um, um, potential. Yeah, just along those lines, I just wanna ask Jude, thanks for that ask, Jude. How does the evolution of science, technology, consciousness, um, move together intellectually, academically, because you, you've written, you know, you've talked about that, you've written books about that. I'm just curious, as we move into this new understanding, as the government has acknowledged another level of reality, what does that do to science, intellect, and conscious evolution? Well, I, th I, think, I think it's a confluence, but yeah. science, and, and in fact, every way in which we as, as human consciousness, collectively, societally, and it's always a dance. It's never a linear thing. Mm. And, you know, in the science of itself, theory can outpace evidence, evidence can outpace theory, and technology can outpace both. And I think we've had a situation over the past decades where the sort of the deeper questionings, as Oscar knows, and many of us know, in terms of the nature of reality, have been put to one side, and the focus has been on technology. And of course, the other issue that science has faced for a very long time is the C word, which is consciousness, because the you know science began with a with a schism between its sort of exploration of the physical world and the, the church. And it was a very sensible schism at the time, because you could get burnt at the stake if you didn't choose the right path. So, but that schism now has, has become unsustainable, untenable, and dangerous. So I think what we now are, alongside this evidential unfolding, is we're actually coming as a, a collective consciousness, potentially, potentially, back into alignment with what I call the evolutionary impulse of the entire universe. Yes. <laughs> so what that does is enable us to bring ourselves into the expanded heart-centered wisdom that we are all Gaians, that we are all microcosmic co-creators of a universe that doesn't just exist and evolve as a unified entity, but literally exists to evolve. So that's my sense of this potentiality. Yeah, and in, and in the future, we're going to need a methodology about how we discern between that which is subjective and that which is objective. We can't go back to one subjective story against another subjective story. Science actually emerged as a way to find a common reference point that you could decide whether the sun went around the earth or vice versa, or the earth was flat or vice versa. And we all have been in spiritual sanghas where there are people very that are dealing with a full deck and have all of these experiences and people who report these experiences and, and are not playing with a full deck. So it becomes it becomes difficult. And I think we're going to what emerges there as a methodology of of discerning relative to these different completely different kinds of data sets. I know all of us here have had these experiences that you know Oscar just elaborated. And we're and sometimes we're reluctant to talk about it because it becomes another subjective story on top of another subjective story. And um, so we're going to have to find a way forward in the future that really has those skill sets intertwined in some way. And I'm not exactly sure what that will be, but. Well, I don't think anyone knows. This is why the government's having a hard time. This is why we're doing these groups. We're finding a methodology of integration. And I don't think it's existed on this level because we have to go to a new level that is uncharted territory. We are hacking our way through the wilderness and of the unknown. And this is the path we're all discovering, not just us, but the plan, the scientific community, the spiritual community. This is bringing it all together in 
a movement of how do we move forward as a planetary civilization to meet the others on an even playing field, not good or bad, better or worse, but as equal sentient beings of consciousness. So this is the excitement I feel that is, is, is so momentous, so um, dr driving us forward at this point, this turning point in history. That's my excitement here. So, is this thanks. where I can step in? Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Diane, is this a good place? Yes, uh, yes, um, yeah, please. So Jean and John, me. yeah, it's a great segue into their sound healing offering yeah. to help lift our vibration. And Jeff is saying goodbye. Yeah, well, goodbye Jeff. That's, the, that's the whole, um, for me, yeah. and I think for us as well. Um, shifting the frequency, uh, creating a total different vibrational field and moving into that, creating a resonant field that embraces the planet, but moves beyond the planet. How do we do that? Uh, the, the easiest way that I know for me is, and you've heard me say this before, so many of you, is I keep working on myself. I keep clearing myself. We already have a global audience. We're already interacting with people from so many different countries right now. And what that does for me is I, I have a responsibility to do everything that I can to keep myself clear so that I can hear the other, whether the other is human or beyond human. Uh, it doesn't matter to me because there is no separation. That's the other piece that to to view that there is that there is separation is one scenario but that's also what gets created so if i'm looking i was thinking about this this morning i was looking at the trees here we've got so many trees around me and i thought today i think i might like to be a tree <laughs> and then suddenly suddenly this thought comes through you already are a tree so I, I just pass that on because as, as we are beginning to reach out to the global audience and, and helping to shift the narrative, it begins here. It begins with me. It begins with each one of us inside. And Oscar, I wanted to say, stand up and give you a, a standing ovation because every, everything that I was hearing you say and I think I can speak for John, okay. we were, we're right there with you, but there is no separation. The other is me. And if I see through that and I do the best I can to come from love at all times, then that's the frequency I be, I create. Now, what, what John and I do, we did this just before coming on the call here. Uh, we created a song, a spontaneous song. Some of you have heard us do this. Some of you have not. But it's a spontaneous song. It doesn't have any words. It has no thought other than, other than the intention of love. That's all. But I'm not thinking love. I just know that that's the intention. But what we know is that the primary sounds are vowel sounds as they would be you know, pronounced in Spanish or quite a not Hebrew, I believe, uh, quite a number of other language, ah, eh, e, o, u. But I'm not thinking about that. There is something deep within me that already knows that. So when I open my mouth and I just let the sound comes, what gets created is exactly what is needed if anything's out of balance to put it back into balance. It reaches out and it touches not just, not just the local reality, but it reaches out and touches the global and then the universal reality. And this is, this is not a myth. This is not fairy tale. This is, I guess, if the closest thing it is, is to is physics. Um, that's another story. Uh, so what... Uh, well, I will tell you this. When John and I went to New Zealand for the first time, and we were honored there by uh, quite a number of Maori. There were about 50 Maori that gathered in a circle. And they wanted to honor John and me. And you know what they did? This beautiful little grandmother steps out into the center of the circle. And she led the group and 
John and that Alice was, that was their prayer. That was their prayer to us, to honor us, not knowing anything much about what we do. So what all I'm saying is, is this is very fundamental, but it shifts, it shifts the vibrational field. And so to raise the frequency of this group right here would create a song, a spontaneous song. And I'm going to sing who I am, just as the Aborigine would say, everything is singing itself into existence. So you, Cindy, will sing Cindy, and Diane will sing Diane, but you're not thinking that. You're simply opening up and letting the frequency move through you, the vibrational sound. And in doing that, collectively, we are creating a resonant field. And when you get hundreds, thousands of people doing this, and we've done this, you begin to create a field that begins to help the frequency of the collective raise. Um, it also takes you out of the thinking mind, okay? This is not a thinking process. So if you start thinking, then uh, let go, just let go. Yeah, uh, so that's how they call in the ships too, in, the, in Close Encounter CE5, yeah, exactly, the same way. That's exactly right. And we'll, we can talk more about that at another time. But I just, and here's something else I've discovered, is how many people around the world are afraid of hearing their own voice if it's not talking? How many people are afraid to just open up and just let sounds come? Songs, melodies, you create them in the instant, right now in this second. But whatever will come is exactly what is needed. Um, this is not a thinking process, so do not think. So I'm just going to start singing. And when I do, I'm going to ask that you open up your mouth and you just begin to let the sounds come. And it may sound chaotic to you at first. But most of us know what the um, what happens when you leave something in chaos long enough. It begins to find harmony. So right now, if you're willing, let's just uh, let yourself hear what you sound like. But then let's do it together. And this will only last for about a minute. If it may be longer, maybe shorter. But this is not about trying to make something long. Okay. Do we take our microphones? Should we unmute ourselves? Or? Oh, yes, unmute mm -hmm. yourselves. Yeah, so that we all can hear wonderfully each other. Kurt, if you're roaming around in there somewhere, unmute yourself, darling. Olivia, you do the same. Okay, are you guys willing to play? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> to the people. When you do this, I suggest that you do it every day. I do it every morning and I do it every night. But what it will do is it will get you out of the thinking mind and suddenly you begin to experience no separation. And you can ride the sounds like a magic carpet. Yeah. Yeah. We could do this a lot longer, but this will have to work for right now. 
Thank I, you. I, it's beautiful. Could you just, Jean, could you just talk a little bit about how that may connect us to these other beings or these other intelligences? Well, do you want to speak to that? Well, let me speak to that first. Um, first, let me say, uh, my, my, uh, my training was chemical engineering in college. <laughs> and um, I had a, had a long history of engineers in my family. So I, I had, to, uh, had to unlearn a bunch of things to be able to feel comfortable in doing this. But what it does is it gets you, like Jean said, it gets you out of your thinking place. It, it uh, creates this vibrant uh, uh, resonant frequency and it opens, opens you up so you can begin to lift the veil and see further than just what you normally consider to be your reality. Because the reality is much, much, much larger than you know, we've been taught about. And we've talked about that already on this, this call. So it, it's, a, it's one quick way to begin to experience that and make yourself more open and sensitive to experiencing ultra terrestrials and, and even yeah. seeing uh, you know, uh, uh, extraterrestrials. Because the name of the game really is raising our own consciousness and, what, and getting to a level of maturity where we can have ongoing overt contact with these kinds of beings. Yeah. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> Thank you so much. It really felt like we were tapping into something that's so beautiful. So it'll be interesting to do that longer next time. Thank you. Maybe at a retreat, Diane. Yes, you know, like we should. That great idea. A contact and contact yeah. and retreat. Yeah. Ooh. Um, I'm also wondering what James O.D. might have to say um, about all this. You're, you're unmuted, well, I've James. Been, I've been absorbing from the masters in this field. But what I would like to say is many of you know I've spent my life honing activism and deep mystical spirituality and in towards global transformation. And one thing you learn from both those fields is there is a price to be paid for change, for transformation. And the price can come at the level of being where you really have to give what you didn't think you had in order to establish new norms, new paradigms in peace, in spiritual encounter. And what I'm interested in in this discourse is very much the whole interface of mapping. What do we need to give at this time in order to elevate the conversation? It's not free, but mm. it is our charge to map. And I've been very interested in the parts of the conversation that talk about integration and mapping of the spiritual, yeah. the, the various modalities so that one integrated multiplicity occurs. And I would say that there is something, as we've been saying, so imperative in all of this. And I have given my life to those imperatives that now is the time for an opening of worldview as Earth faces these challenges, as we face intense levels of corruption. So that's why I'm listening, participating. I'm trying to map the whole integration 
of where the movement must go, how it must arise, and what it truly has to say to a suffering world. Thank you. Hey, can we add that, Diane, to our mission statement about what do we need to give to, to map this new world? I mean, or, or to an agenda for next or today or whenever, but that- Maybe James, could you type something up as an addition to our mission statement or something? That, like that? That, I think that was such a key point, James, yeah. that we've sort of all been waiting for as a trigger yeah. to defining ourselves or forming our consciousness with intent. This is, this is exactly, I think, what we've been kind of fishing for in this circle. So thank you. I mean, that's my opinion. Yeah, it's a really important component. Yeah, what do we have to give? Because, yeah. yeah. What's that, Diane? No, absolutely. I totally agree. And if there's any other points um, that you think should be added to our mission statement after you, everybody reviews it, please let us know so we can add them. But I mean, I know it's late today because we've been here for more than an hour, but I think that would be something that I would be curious about at our next meeting to just see what everyone has to share. What are we willing to give up? What are we willing to let go of in order to have this dialogue with the universe, with the cosmos that we haven't been willing to look at before? I mean, that's, I want to look at that for myself, so. Yeah. As James emphasized, the, the key is sacrifice. That's a yeah. very important component of his message, I believe. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, yes. so let's have that as a key conversation for the next call next yeah. month. Another, another, another piece, this, I hear you use the word sacrifice, Oscar. I would use the word invest as well. What is it that I'm willing to invest? Uh, because it's not just about giving up. It's what, I, what am I willing to give? What am I willing to invest? Give and give up, yeah. So, I also, yeah, sacrifice to make sacred. It's all those things. It's like maybe give mm. up is just an old worldview, right? So yeah, give up. Energy. Well, that's one, or maybe it's much more personal. I don't. Mm -hmm. From a point of view of uh, a vision quest or a traditional going up on the hill or seeking union with the imperishable world that all too infrequently erupts within this transitory one. Um, <laughs> hardship and struggle is, is a key part of it, uh, on a speaking from a traditional shamanic perspective. So, uh, you know, it, it's a good thing if you uh, spill blood of your own. I'm speaking, of course, metaphorically, I, I'm not a, a masochist by any means, or a sage, <laughs> but I'm saying that it, it does involve, uh, yes, investing your whole self in that quest, and at the same time, fully prepared to spill blood. I, I also have to say to that, Oscar, this is what we have done for 5,000 years, spilled a lot of blood in search of freedom, and we may be able to move into a future in a different way. I just you know, because it's there's been a lot of blood spilt over. I, I'm not referring to that type of blood, brother. No, I I I'm, know, but, but I'm talking about shamanic initiation. You know, it's, this is we are going through a, a rite of passage that's huge. Yeah, and it's not going. It's not something that uh, is going to be cushy. I meant okay. it on that that level. Yeah, no, I get that. I Maybe get that. instead of a retreat, we do a vision quest. You know, we have an initiation. That would be really cool. Yeah. So, Oscar, since uh, you're going to be leading the clothing, closing, I don't know, if Cindy, if you're going to be joining him, but uh, it's your moment. I think we have 10 minutes left. We said we were going to go an hour, but uh, maybe 90 I, minutes are better. For are you sure you haven't had enough of, of this holographic projection? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we love it. We love the background. <laughs> so, so uh, return, returning... To, to set things up, um, it's been very robust, very uh, 
challenging at the at the same time hopeful conversation or discourse. And what, what I'm experiencing as an integrative um, offering to our circle that may carry into those who are not present is an alignment with what is known in the tradition of my ancestors as the Keshwa Chaka or the rainbow bridge activation that involves you know, awakening our higher centers through breath and visualization and, and planting a seed in the field of possibility that, that we all are sustainers of, right? Um, and I paraphrase Carl Jung when he says, and I mentioned it just a minute ago, the only thing worth telling is that story when the imperishable world erupts into this transitory one. And to me, that experience is one of grace, right? And just the other morning, I woke up with this message and it said, grace requires space. Grace requires space. And it is the lack of spaciousness in the world that is preventing complete and permanent grace to befall, to be bestowed upon us. So this activating of our higher centers is intended to open up to the spaciousness so that this grace can visit us. So I'm gonna ask you all to go ahead and close your eyes, please. Make sure that both of your palms are opened uh, to the above, and you may place them on your thighs, knees, or on your desk surface, wherever you're sitting. And bring your awareness to breath. And exhale all the air from your breath and briefly hold on the exhalation, please. And then, Begin a, an effortless, natural rhythm of breathing through the nose at your own pace. As is most comfortable and natural to you. And as you do so, relax your mandible, your jaw, so that your mouth remains slightly open. Tip of tongue gently in touch with your upper palate. Using the divine sight within your mind's eye. Imagine this shaft of luminous, radiant light descending from the infinitude that is beyond all form and flowing down into your higher centers, into your crown. We understand that to be the Hatung Wilka, Hanak Pachamanda Saiwa, that by just invoking its name allows it to energetically become available to all here present and beyond. The shaft of light enters through your higher center, the top portion of your head amplifying your capacity to be a vessel of grace in the world. You may feel a slight tingling sensation and energizing of that higher center physically. Now using your higher will, direct that shaft of light to your brow, to your pituitary area. also feel a soft pressure in that area as well. And softly direct it, will it, to your occiput, to the posterior area, where your cerebellum and medulla are located. So both spiritual brain and anatomical brain become united through light, 
feel it, experience it, be it, light. you do so with an open, expanded heart, bring forth into consciousness your most expansive, most recent experience of love, either love that you extended to another or love that was extended to you. memory allow it to become a lived experience here and now, filling your entire being with its beauty and grace, love. and space of pure, luminous, loving presence. Allow yourself to merge with the world our entire planetary Gaia sphere. And as one soul born on earth, know that you are one soul with the cosmos and creation as a whole itself. Remember this, experience it, be it. And know that you can carry this experience with every breath into all relationships of which you are called to be part of and serve. On the count of three, gently and slowly open your eyes, feeling refreshed, energized, in peace and perfect harmony, able to grow and evolve into the shining ones that you are. One, you're aware of your breath, your breathing, your physical body, strong, cleansed, purified. Alive. Two, you're aware of the physical location, the room you're in, the people you're with. Three, very gently, slowly open your eyes. Three. Thank you so much, Oscar. This call certainly felt like an activation from start to finish. So, mm -hmm. so appreciate that. Um, yeah. And thank you, so, everyone, to Alan, Jean, and John, everyone that um, was part of this call. Just quickly. Well, how do, well, no, I just want to say, why don't we all look for the next call? What are we willing to sacrifice or give up or let go of um, if we want this new world to unfold? personally, collectively, whatever level we, I mean, I think that's a great, I, that's something I want to think about because uh, James really, you know, touched a point of how change has to happen. It's, the, you know, the caterpillar, let's go, <laughs> you know, eating green leaves to become something else. Just keep looking at the news. This is a growing developmental story. JJ, I and Desiree will be on top of it and Kurt and, um, it's exciting that 
We're seeing the world change. What's that, um, Oscar? This is the latest, the latest issue of Parabola magazine, one of my favorite periodicals. Do you all see what it says there? Um, UFOs, the heat rises. Nice. This is the latest version of Parabola magazine. Oh, great. Thank you for that. I'm going to get that. This is a, it's a great, great article, but this is like equivalent to the increase of sightings. It's, that's, I've never seen anything like that on the Wow, that's so great. Cool. And then let's right. plan our vision quest. I'm so looking, maybe it could be a ghost ranch in New Mexico. Good. For some of us who had a vision quest a few years ago. Well, next year we'll do a live retreat advance, huh? Yeah. Oh. But this might be a special one, right? It might be special one just for our. Look, we could include a CE5 in that as well.